Okay, good afternoon, Sean. Hey, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks. How's yourself, Robert? Doing very, very well. Uh, Sean, let me do some introductions for those people who will be uh, listening to this um, through the Achieve More uh, social media platforms and through our website uh, in the coming days and weeks. Uh, Today I'm having a chat with a, a friend, a, a fairly new friend, but a friend of the charity a, and on a personal level, a, someone who is supporting me in my own fitness a, activities a, in, in recent times. A, this is Sean Fantana. Sean is, um, well, he's a lot of things actually. A, he's, he's the owner a, of Fantana Fit. Uh, which is a personal fitness uh, organisation um, working with individuals and groups of people to motivate them to get fit, to achieve their goals in terms of fitness, uh, whether that be physically uh, being active, lifting weights or whatever, or whether it's to do with uh, achieving goals in terms of running distances and the like. I get to that, Sean himself is a uh, middle distance and, and latterly uh, a long distance runner who uh, has uh, some accolades to his name and I hope you don't mind Sean but if I can just mention some of these accolades because I think it will be relevant to the, the conversation that we have. Uh, you have been the National 10K Road Champion, you have been American Conference 5000 Meters Champion, Two times national 5,000 metres track and field champion, uh, and you've represented Scotland uh, at middle distance uh, running. And uh, of late, you've been part of the Commonwealth Games marathon training squad. Am I right in saying that? Is that have, have I done you justice? Yeah, you've done me justice there, yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, Tell us a wee bit about uh, the, 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 the accolades, okay, you, you, you've been National 10K Road Champion uh, in, in, in Scotland uh, and then you spent time in America and uh, have, have, have won a number of top races there. So tell us about the American Conference 5000 metres uh, in, 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 in which you were the champion. What was involved in that? You know, who, who's involved? What, you know, tell us a bit about it. Yeah, so the... The conference that I was in was at, at altitude, uh, so we, we live at sea level where there's lots of oxygen and then the school that I went to college was Adam State University and that was at seven and a half thousand feet above sea level, so kind of like the way you know Kenya and Ethiopia, the East Africans train at altitude, come down to sea level and run really fast, I thought I would do the exact same except this was in America. And I got the opportunity to represent Adam State University as a scholarship athlete. And that was after I ran 29 minutes and 16 seconds for 10K. They offered me a full scholarship. So I decided to pursue one of my childhood dreams, and that was to be an American scholarship athlete. And it was, it was such an inc incredible experience. You know, there's, there's still days where I go out with athletes out on a run and, you know, sometimes the, the American dream of going to college and running as a professional athlete in university, it, sometimes it just takes you back thinking, yeah, I was, I was there and spent four years in the States and lived and breathed this professional university lifestyle. And at, at Adams State University, I... Yeah, I won the, the American Conference 5,000 metre championship and that was, again, at altitude. And before the race, you know, I, I was in great shape. Uh, I fully believed that I was capable of doing really well. But there was something about a sea level athlete going to altitude and racing at an elevation that isn't quite comfortable. And that, that kind of makes you nervous, kind of makes you a bit scared because you're thinking maybe you're already a handicap, you know, you're already allowing athletes to have a better positional standpoint than you are in the race because you're coming up and they're coming down. And, well, I, you know, I, I decided I'd warm up and, you know, give it my best. And from there, it was, it was indoors as well. So it was an indoor 5,000 metres, which is very, very alien to, to British track and field and European track and field. The, the, the most we go to is 3,000 metres. So in America, you can do 5K in there as well. And so that was a lot of, a lot of laps of the track, 200 metres. That was, 
was that 25, 25 laps of the track, 25 laps of the track. And for sure it was, it seemed like a long way and seemed really daunting. But as the, as everybody, as every athlete knows and as every athlete knows that when the gun goes, the nerves leave your body and you just go into race mode, you get focused and you decide, right, it's, it's now or never. So my training had been going so well, that I thought, right, calm myself down and let's get in amongst it. You know, I'm here for a reason and that's to compete against the top athletes in America. And if I'm here wearing an Adam State vest, then I'm also one of those, be one of those best athletes in America as well. So I'm here for a reason. And, you know, race took off, went out nice and slow. And that makes people nervous. But for me, I, because I've came from the 1500 meter background up to the 5k and the 10k, I really believe in my, my sprint finish. So it was kind of like a patient game where kind of like chess, where you, you don't make your moves too early, keep your cards close to your chest. And the roar from one thing that I can say in, in America, being part of a college and doing indoor track and field is the noise is unbelievable. Like you're in an enclosed space and you can just hear the each university scream on their own um, teammate in the race. And, it, you know, sometimes it makes your heart rate go a little bit faster than normal. So you have to keep yourself calm. And, you know, we're, we're, all, we're all there competing for that one gold medal, that one top spot. And there can only be one of us. And there was, there was about 20, 20 of us in the race. And, it, you know, lap by lap, I'm still there. I started to get a little out of breath, you know, about 2,000 metres into the race, 3,000 metres to go. And I kind of started to panic because I was thinking that I was getting tired because I'm at altitude. And I'm thinking, oh, no, this is where these guys are going to run away from me. And this is this is the end of my race. Like, I'm not maybe going to be able to keep up with the guys. But I always go back to a really good quote that my very first coach gave me. And he said, if you're hurting, they're hurting. So stick in. So I decided I just take it lap by lap, not overthink it too much. And you know, we got to you know five laps to go now. I'm still you know top three in the race. All the universities are going wild for all their, their, their teammates in the race. My my university is going crazy because it's uh, you know myself and a rival university going head to head, and it's for the conference championship as well, the team championship. So these points were really vital. And my my training partner, but my, my other teammate, he was starting to lose touch with the pack. So I was going, well, it's only me now that can get these points for the team to help us win the team title. And I was really hurting in my, my chest, my throat. It was like raw fire. I'm trying to dig in. You know, I was around about, I think we're about 4,000 metres above sea level. And, uh, you know, we, we get down to two laps to go, 400 metres to go. And it's just, you know, everybody was roaring and the adrenaline just took over. You know, I could be, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a boy from Glasgow, from Scotland, in the United States of America, taking on the best athletes in America. And I'm well, right now I'm looking around going, well, I've got a silver medal. But you know, that that mentality is the the crowd and the, the fans are cheering you on. You you get that adrenaline and you go, Well, maybe I'll go for gold, you know, because that's the whole that's I've always thought that's the whole point of a race. Mm -hmm. You go out to, to win it. And um about yeah, about 300 meters to go. I just kick as hard as I can and don't look back. And I just hear you know my Adam State teammates roaring at the top of their voice. And the gap, I, I look round two or three times, kind of like a like a Mo Farah, you know, where he, he kicks and he looks back a few times, and everybody's like, "Don't look back, just keep going." So I decided, you know, just keep keep pushing on as fast as I could. Um, we're about 100 meters to go up the home stretch. I'm in a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, gritting my teeth squint my eyes and I, I just I, I come across the line first I'm comp you know you need to scrape me off the track I'm completely done I am completely 100% spent and you know I come across the line finish first for you know my university Adam State and you've got all the the university teammates coming over hugging me grabbing me you know I'm trying to tell them to leave me alone because I need I need air to breathe because I've got so little of it altitude and it was just, it was a really, that was a big turning moment for me for, you know, thinking, am I, am I worthy of the scholarship that I was getting? Am I, 
am I one of the best athletes in America? Am I one of the best athletes in Britain? And these sometimes you don't you don't know these things until you put yourself out there yeah. and actually go out, take a chance on yourself, take a risk, take a bet on yourself. And you know, sometimes you pull it off, sometimes you don't, but you never know unless you're going to take that chance. And it was from then on it filled me full of confidence to, you know, represent Adam State at the the national championships as well. You know, it was it was just a it was a really amazing, surreal experience and sometimes looking back on it I I forget about it you know mm -hmm. when, when I when I talk about it just now it brings back all those amazing feelings but you know as you get caught up in your own life and you know the hustling bustle of working and training when you're back in Glasgow back in Scotland you can you can forget you know very quickly the the sort of the great moments you had mm -hmm. out in the out in America so that was a it was a tough experience you know balancing university and athletics whilst flying all across America. Um, I think people may think that it's very glamorous, but at the same time, you know, getting red eye flights at, you know, sure. 6 a.m., 5 a.m. to then go to a track meet and race at 10 a.m. or 12 a.m. In, in the same day. It's sometimes it can be quite draining, quite exhausting, but I would not I would not change the experience for the world. That was probably one of my favorite races and biggest highlights of America being one of the yeah. You know, being the conference, the, the American conference champion. What what really strikes me, uh, as you're describing it there, is it's physically exhausting. Of course, you collapse at the end. You're wanting your, your you know, uh, <laughs> colleagues to give you a bit of space to get breath and things like that. But clearly, before and during that race, and even after, in terms of what you've just described. There's a mental element to this. It's, it's, it's mental strength as well, isn't it? It's about you know believing that you're there because you've got every right to be there. Uh, it's about believing that you can compete. It's about believing that you can win, and then it's about uh, kicking you on to that next next level. Uh, and that you know you justify your scholarship, you justify your place in the team, and and and. I think one of the things that you know uh, I'm keen to discuss because it is Mental Health Awareness Week is this whole thing about uh, staying staying motivated and, and, and using uh, the mental uh, side uh, of things to, to, to keep fit and keep active during uh, what is a, a, an unprecedented period in, in anyone's life. Uh, mm -hmm. And what you've described in terms of that one race there uh, certainly brings to the fore that the, the the mental side of things is so important. You need to be mentally strong eh, to achieve, not just physically in the best shape you could be. Is that fair to say? Yeah, like I I I use a an analogy to my my clients and you know people who do want the advice of you know how do you stay motivated? How do you stay disciplined? You know, some people train really really hard and but mentally they're not quite there in terms of being able to put themselves in a position to perform well. And I always look at it as, if you if you look at Formula One, and we look at the car, and we look at the driver, and for a while, Formula One, all the cars were restricted. They all had to have the same components, whether it was Mercedes, whether it was Ferrari, whether it was McLaren. And so what ha I mean, all the cars were the same. What separated first to 22nd on yeah. the grid? was a driver. And what I look at that is in terms of the car is our body and our mind is a driver. And we can we can do so much with the car. We can do we've got two arms, two legs, a beating heart and a set of lungs. Everybody's got it. But what can differentiate myself from my other competitors, from my my rivals, teammates, it's it's the mindset, it's the driver in the car. That's what helps drive my car. Mm -hmm. It's the brain and the machine that helps me, you know, in days where it's, it's raining outside, it's blowing a gale. Um, I've, I've had a hard training session, but my coaches tell me to get up and do 20 miles the next day for a long run. And I'm just thinking, man, I don't want my legs to be my legs today. Like, I want somebody else's legs. <laughs> but it's, the, it's understanding that the brain can play a massive role in keeping you where you want to be in life. Mm -hmm. And I feel that, you know, there's a lot of people that are physically gifted, physically talented, but that can only take you so far. 
you know, it, it might be great that, I, you know, as a 11, 12, 13, 14 year old boy is the best football player in their team, is the, the best athlete on the track in their junior years. But as you get to senior level, when you get to senior competition, it's your brain that's going to separate you from the rest. The talent isn't going to take you any further than the, the willingness to be disciplined and use your mental toughness to get you to the next level. Yeah. So I fully believe that your, your mindset has a massive, massive role in separating you from the good and the great. Aye, aye, I think, I think you're right. And, and we'll come back to that a wee bit, if, 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 if you don't mind, as we go through the conversation. And again, I think it's, it's in some respects, I think it, it's, it's very positive to start with, with, with the great things, you know, the great experience in America, the championships, the accolades, that sort of thing. But I think so one of the things that I think I'm sure you would be very keen to emphasise, and, and I am, is, 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 is a person who, who works with so many young people, is it doesn't, it shouldn't disguise what you see on your website and what you read about Sean Fintana. We shouldn't uh, forget the fact that there's a hell of a lot of hard work went into that and there's a journey and the Sean Fintana that I'm talking to now, the Sean Fintana that will post on his social media, it's not the Sean Fintana uh, who was a 12, 13, 14 year old boy and the reason I say that is because obviously I follow you on social media and just in, in the last week or so, uh, you, you've made some fairly powerful posts uh, designed to, to um, motivate um, people. But, you know, you've, you've put your, I mean, pardon the pun, but you laid yourself bare to a certain extent. You know, you put two images on that stand out for me. The 14-year-old boy with the ice cream sitting on holiday, uh, who, let's just say, was not in the, 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 the best of shapes. Uh, and then fast forward to the Sean Fintana uh, of recent times, who's training for marathons, who's uh, a national uh, 5, 5K champion, uh, who was one of the fastest 10K runners in the UK. Um, you know, these two things, you know, are, are, are different lives. Are we? It's the same guy, but they're different lives. Tell us a wee bit about your background and yeah. that 14-year-old boy eh, and, and, and the mindset at that time and what then motivated you to become the Sean Fintana you are now. If you don't mind, tell us your story. Yeah, so I go, I, the story goes all the way back to me uh, being brought up and I was born in Drumchapel, Drumchapel, Scotland in the West End of Glasgow and it's not a very... It's not the West the West End. <laughs> It's, it's not the Golden Hill of Glasgow, let's just say that. And, you know, it was, that was where everything began. That's where everything started. That's where I'd look at life, I looked at life in a little bit of a different way of, you know, maybe other people that maybe went to private school that did go to, that did maybe was brought up in Jordan Hill or Newton Mearns or, but again, that's me stereotyping back as a kid, you know, thinking that other people have it better than me. Oh, we all did it. Uh, and, you know, coming from a council estate and, you know, getting bullied for being overweight as a kid. And the reason I was overweight as a kid was because I was extremely selfish as a kid. Um, anything I wanted, I got it. And if I didn't get it, I would shout and scream about it and throw a tantrum until I did get it. And my mum and dad would basically give in and give me what I wanted and you know the, the, they were doing it out of love, they weren't doing it, you know, they, they didn't want to be bad parents and nobody wants to be bad parents so you, you give your kid as much as you can. Yeah. Obviously now being the, the Sean Fontana I'm now, like I asked my mum and dad like why did they do that, like why did they keep just giving in to me, why didn't they make me tougher? Uh, maybe and it might be a blessing that I actually had to find it out and figure it out for myself instead of being told, mm -hmm. you know, so I really learned the value on my own. But back then, childish kid, anything I wanted, I got, whether it was sweeps, whether it was, you know, wrestlers in the, at the time or a PlayStation game or a DVD, you name it, like my mum and dad would give it to me. But as, as long as, you know, again, like two working class parents, they, they couldn't get me an iPhone or anything like that sort of thing, but they would, they would get me as much as they could with the, the money they had. And, you know, this 
in life, you start to learn that in life and in sport, what you want and what you get are two completely different things. And, you know, I would get upset if I lost at football, I'd get upset if I lost, you know, in sports day, if I wasn't the fastest kid in my class. And, it, you know, these these upsets kept happening, but I didn't, I didn't basically like wake up. I just kept thinking it was everybody else's fault and not mine's. So I had that sort of, you know, this victim mentality. And we, we, we then moved to Mary Hill. And from there, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting even bigger as a, uh, a boy. You know, I'm, I'm now, you know, 10, 11, 12 stone as a, as a 12, 13 year old boy. You know, getting into, I'm, I'm actually becoming, you know, 33, 34 inch waist mm -hmm. in jeans and things like that. And again, my mum feed me out of love. You know, we'd, we'd sit down on a Friday and a Saturday night, have a Chinese and an Indian or a, a Pizza Hut takeaway. And she would do that, one, one, because she wanted it, but then she wanted me to, you know, her son, you know, to be beside her, you know. Like, it was kind of, it was this, basically, we were comfort eating together. We were, you know, at the weekend, that's what, you know, families in, in Mary Hill and Drum Chapel, they do to get a takeaway at the weekend. And that was just, that was just how it was. And... They never, push, they never pushed me either. They never pushed me to be good at sport. They never pushed me to be good at school. They just kind of let me make my mind up for something. They just let me sort of float through school and, and life. But one, one thing was for sure was the more and more I kept becoming last pick in football, the, the more times I kept getting bullied in school. You know, I was in and out of fights trying to defend myself because I was getting, you know, called fatty six bellies or the Michelin man or you know, all the all the names under the sun. And eventually it got really exhausting. It, you know, fighting, you know, come back home with black eyes and, you know, bruises in my legs and my, you know, my, my body because, you know, people were picking on me because I was I was really overweight as a kid. And again, coming from Mary Hill and, and Drum Chapel, you know, sometimes you kids kids can be, you know, kids can be mean that way. And I mean it can happen anywhere, but you know, back back in the day these, these were rough places, and if you didn't learn how to defend yourself, then well, your, the bullies were going to completely walk over you. So I was always, I would always try and fight back, and eventually got to a point where, you know, I, I just, I was, I got to a point where I was sick of it. I was absolutely sick of getting picked on, being the last picked in football, not being able to do any of the cross country races in my school, and I decided enough's enough. And I think it was at a point where I actually asked my dad. He, we were, were sitting in the house, I asked my dad, I said, Dad, do you think I'm fat? And he said, do you want the dad answer? Do you want the honest answer? I said, I, I, want, I want the honest answer. And he was like, well, son, you know, it's, it's quite hard watching you play football with other kids when their dads are at the sideline and I'm at the sideline. You know, you can't keep up with them or, you know, you don't want the ball. You're, you're, you're scared to go up for a header, you're, you're scared to go in for a tackle. You know, it, it's, quite, it's quite hard to see that, son. And it, it was at that point where even my dad, so, you know, bullies can bully me, and I, I don't really know them, but when even your dad, somebody that you, you know, is your role model at a point, yeah. and life tells you that they're, they're a little bit embarrassed of you, not in terms of being your son, but just in terms of watching you play sport that you can't, you know, you you can't do very much because you're you're not fit. And it was about I think it was about a month before Christmas as well, I can remember. And I, I was I was like, right, that's it. Um no more junk food, no more. Woke up the next day, you know, my mum and dad were both both whispering to themselves thinking, oh, he's not gonna he's not gonna do this. And you know, I, I strong I, I just strongly felt like I'm I'm gonna change. So I decided, that's it, no more junk food, no more, you know, crisps, sweets, no Burger Kings, no KFCs, no McDonald's. And you no were Chinese. 14 or 15 then? Uh, 14, yeah. That's incredibly powerful eh? emotionally, you know, just to, to, to be in that mindset. That's incredibly powerful. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's, because of the trauma I went through in terms of, you know, there'll be times where, I would get tripped up in school and then a, and I, I might have been in primary four, primary five, and I, a guy from primary seven would drag me across the concrete and tear my uniform 
along my back and I've um, sort of blood patches up my back. My dad had to come into school to, you know, talk to the headmaster and go, how you let, why are you letting this happen to my boy? Mm-hmm. And, you know, so there was, there's all these bits of trauma that happened to me. Um, and this is where I think about, you know, people go, oh, well, how can you, how can you change? And I said, I, I put it along the lines of, there's a pain pleasure scale that we have as human beings. And for a long time, I had a lot of pleasure out of eating McDonald's, eating KFCs and eating Burger Kings. There was a lot of pleasure there. But there's, there is pain to that as well. The pain is that you will gain weight, you'll become unfit, and you won't be able to do well at sport, or ultimately you have health problems down the line. There's always a pain and a pleasure scale to anything that you do. But if that pleasure outweighs the pain, you're going to do it no matter what. Mm-hmm. It's the same with smokers. They know that they may get mouth cancer, throat cancer, lung cancer, but the pleasure of smoking that cigarette outweighs the pain of what's going to happen to them. Mm-hmm. So what has to happen is there has to be a shift. It has to, the, the food has to be actually become more painful than it is pleasurable. And that, at that time, that's what happened to me. I, don't, I didn't know it at the time, but the, the traumatic events and then my dad tipping the scale of going, right, actually eating this food now is becoming more painful to me than it is pleasurable. The, the, the pain of me going out and exercising now is actually the thought of, it's actually more pleasurable to go out and exercise now than it is painful because I need to, I need to change. And, you know, I went about it the wrong way at the start. I didn't, you know, being 14 years old, I just, all I'd done was have an apple and a bowl of cereal a day. That was it. I starved myself every single day and I fell asleep during school. All my, all my friends would be worried about me, you know, I, I looked yellow as if I had jaundice because I, I was lacking so many vitamins and minerals. Um, but, you know, I was, I was determined to, one, lose weight, two, get better at football, get better at sport, not be the last picked in three. At that time, I know it's, it's, it's vanity, but I wanted to be popular with the girls. You know, so I had... Well, I had a, a, <laughs> you know, the skinny guys are popular. They're getting the chicks. I want the chicks, so I'm going to get skinny so I can get popular. And, you know, it, in a... In a in a weird way, it worked. You know, I, I, start, I started losing weight. I was becoming more popular. People were speaking to me. The bullies weren't bullying me anymore. So there was this sort of positive reinforcement of me starving myself. But it got to a point where, you know, I'd have no energy to even do a PE. I had no energy to go out and, you know, basically just go out with my friends and play football after school. So I was like, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start eating properly. So then I would go online and say, like, you know, I'd be like, how to how to eat properly. So I start googling these things at 14 years old. So basically, I started coaching myself at a, a really young a young age, which ultimately led to me being a trainer now. And it it uh, I would you know I'd eat the big bowls of pasta. I'd, eat, I'd drink the orange juice. I'd have the big bowls of cereal in the morning. I'd have my sandwiches for lunch. So I was still eating the way the food pyramid said you know eat healthily, but. I feel I've got quite a I've got quite a big, big appetite. I like big portions, so I was slowly putting the weight back on again, um, and it was going round like the sort of bottom of my belly. And I remember one of my friends, you know, grabbing the bottom of my belly and going, "Oh, Sean, mate, you're 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 starting to get chubby again." And he was only joking, but because of how mm-hmm. how how powerful the weight loss journey has been for me, I took it to heart, and that's where I actually started becoming bulimic. Right. At around 14 and a half, 15 years old. And I'm one of those people that don't, even when I'm really, really bad food poisoning, I've got, you know, um, I've got the flu, it's really hard for me to be sick. So when my mum and dad can hear me in the toilet at night when we're going to bed, bringing, you know, bringing food back up, you know, after a couple of nights, I started catching on, like thinking, Something's not quite right here. And instead of my, this was probably one of the best things my mum ever done was she actually, she, she was reading this like sort of whatever heat magazine or whatever it was. And at that time there was a, there was a, an actress who was bulimic, but they, they caught a photo of her smiling and the, because she'd been bulimic, it rotted her teeth, mm-hmm. green and it rotted her teeth. And she never said to me, you know, 
don't stop making yourself sick. She just went, oh, look, oh, look at that. Look at those teeth. And I was like, oh, they're disgusting. And she's like, oh, it's because she's been making herself sick. And then she'd talk, she's a pharmacist now, so she would be talking to me going, you know, like, being sick can actually burn the inside of your, your throat, the inside of your mouth, and it can also make your teeth look like that. And I was like, oh, God, I don't want that to happen to me. So it kind of pushed me away from that. And from there, so all I done was, all I was doing was using food to help me get to where I wanted to go. Yeah. I've not even exercised yet. So I've tried every single diet in the book. And it was just, it was good and it was bad and it was good and it was bad. The same way with yo-yo diet just now. And then ultimately it led to a point where is I'm going, well, I like my food, but I eat big portions. So how about I start exercising? So it was a really good point where my mum was training up for the Bella Houston Women's 10K, the one for cancer research. And, you know, we'd go out running together, but I couldn't keep up with her. You know, I'm a 14, 14, 15 year old boy, can't keep up with her. His, his, his mum that is maybe 35, 40 years old, you're going, mate, what? and she smokes as well. So I'm going, what, what, what's, what's happening here? So while she would, she used to work till about five o'clock at night, I'd get home from school at about you know, quarter past three. I decided on the days we didn't run together, I would, go, I would sneak out and go a run before she get back from work and then go back up the stairs and play my PlayStation or do my homework or whatever. And week on week, I was starting to catch up with her. And she's going, how are you getting good so quick? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm just, you know, my natural. And uh, that, was, that was the first point where I started taking exercise a little bit seriously. And then from there, doing the running, helped me then get better at football. And then getting better at football helped me become popular. And all this started feeding a cycle of exercise is good now. <laughs> exercise is really good. And it also helped me stay away from the kids who smoked and drank in high school and at the, the weekends. It, on a Friday and a Saturday night, they'd want to go out and get drunk and they'd want to go and smoke and, you know, drugs or whatever it would be. And even at that age, I was... I would go, nah, like, ah, I'm, I've, you know, I'm going to go and play. I've got, a, I've got a game for my team tomorrow, a football match, or I've, I've got, I'm going to go and do a run with, you know, my mum and her friends. And, you know, it, they, would, they would tease me and be like, ah, oh, you're pansy and all that, like, you're not running with women and all. But, you know, eventually I started winning the cross-country races for my school. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the pansy and the, all these tease words, they stopped because I started to win. And people want to be around winners. At that age, you, you, you want to be around winners are cool. So, you know, I was, it, it was a, I, I finally stopped getting bullied. It was amazing. Like, I stopped getting bullied through a weight loss journey and an exercise, like a, a nutrition and an exercise journey. And it was, for me, I think that because it was such a powerful thing for me to stop getting bullied and actually be popular and have admiration from other people instead of getting picked on that just kept fueling the fire for me for a long time until exercise became almost like an occupation for me mm -hmm. so it, you know back back as a kid it took something really traumatic for me to be the way I am now but the person that I am just now wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the person that I was when I was 14 15 years old mm -hmm. and it's even in the days where now at 29 years old, I, I don't feel like going out and doing a, a training session or I don't go out, like going out to do a run or in the wet, in the bad weather or the rain or the wind. The, the power that those bullies had on me at that time has shaped my mind to never give up and never give in. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, again, that what, what, what you've been talking about just reinforces the, the importance in the mental side of things. You know, it's, it's not just about getting out and running eh, or going to football training. If it's not right up top, you know, how are you going to stay motivated to eat the right things, to keep doing the right things, to, to not fall for the peer pressure? Easiest thing in the world when you're 14, 15, hanging about with your mates on a Friday night, you know, having, you know, those first tastes of alcohol, and there might be groups of girls there that you're interested in, and and to, to be have the mental strength to say no is, is, is you know, so, so, so powerful, and something that is a message that, you know, I, 
for me, is very important for teenagers to, to, to get across. Uh, you know, uh, yes, we all want to be popular. Uh, it's not the be all and end all, um, but you know, it, it, it's it's about having a, a strength of character about you that, that, that you know will, will shape you for the rest of your life. The twenty nine year old Sean goes back to his fourteen year old self and, and remembers the things that made him change uh, the way he thought and he ate and was to be the guy he is now. And and you know and, and I think you and I have spoken about this uh, a couple of times. You know there is this whole thing about. Uh, young people nowadays want the quick fix. You know, they'll look at the two Sean's in those pictures that you posted and say, I want to be that big tall guy there with a the six pack uh, and the bulging muscles and I want it next week. You know, yeah. <laughs> and, they, and they are not willing to put that sort of 14, 15 year journey in there to, you know, yeah. to get there. And, and, and it's, it's, it's about how you you, me, other people get that message through to young people that you know, these things are lifelong. You, know, they, you, you, you don't just flick a switch and things change. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there is a hell of a lot of work. There are ups and there are downs, you know, you're right. You know, I mean, like, again, you know, like yesterday was my long run day and the last thing I wanted to do was get in that pissing rain. You know, mm -hmm. but you know, I get myself out there and I came back feeling absolutely amazing. And I know, uh, you know, most runners are, are like that once they get out there. But I could easily have talked myself out of getting out that door. Uh, yeah. and, and, and you know, and in, in, in many senses, young people can easily talk themselves out of doing something positive because. It takes too long to get to where I want to be, you know, so I'll just go for the quick fix. Uh, and that's something, again, you know, uh, we, we need to look at, we need to work on as a nation. Uh, as, 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 the, as well as the physical, I mean, Scotland is known as a sick man of Europe, but, you know, I think it is mentally sick as well because, you know, we, we tend to give in to the easy options, the Chinese, the Friday night, the fish suppers. A couple of cats at Lagos where our mates, you know, you know but if you want to, you know, if you want to be fit and healthy and have that six pack and look good and be popular, there's a job to be done there, isn't there? There really is. And it's, it's how we get there eh, that, that is, is convincing people. And then when people fail, and people do fail, you know, and, you know, it, it took you a number of attempts to get to where you wanted to be. That's life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Don't beat yourself up when you fail. Learn the lessons from it. And that's that's exactly what you've said again. You know, you learned lessons from the eating habits that you had and how you changed them and what you wanted to do, you know. Uh, so there are clear messages out there uh, that, that, that we need to get across to young people. Take us on a wee bit. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll sort of jump back and forward. We started with, with, with America and the accolades, and then we'll go back to your childhood and the decisions you made to get fit, eh, to be more healthy, to become popular, whatever it is. But where are you now? T tell us a wee bit about where you are now, both in terms of your running and in terms of your profession. Eh, tell us a wee bit about your life as it is just now. Yeah, uh, so just now, I have my own, own business, Fontana Fit Personal Training, and I've been doing I've been doing personal training now for around 12, 11 or 12 years now, officially since I've got back from America from my, my honours degree that I got there. Uh, I've, I've used that and officially built the, the personal training practice and, you know, officially called it Fontana Fit Personal Training. And if we sort of like switch back to and from sport and business, it was... It was athletics that has helped teach me a lot about business. When there's days where you don't want to go to work, you can't be bothered. You know, you, you're, you're maybe getting into work and you've got a boss that you don't like or an employee you don't like, or even sometimes you just, you're just having a bad day and you just don't want to go in, you don't want to face it. I feel on my, my running, my athletics, is a way of toughening me for business. So. There'll be days where, like I was saying previously, where I don't want to, sometimes I, I don't feel like going out and doing a 20 mile run, but I also don't like being beat. Mm -hmm. So the pain pleasure scale comes in there, it goes, well, you're, you don't want to go for a 20 mile run, but you don't want to be beat by your competitors. What one do you don't want? What one do you not want more? Mm -hmm. I don't want to be beat. 
So I go and choose the the the, 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 the first one. I go and run 20 miles. And that's how I look at my business as well. There's going to be days where I'm going to feel bad. I'm going to feel, I don't want to go to work today. I feel what and I had a bad sleep or, you know, something bothered me. I had an argument with my my wife or whatever it may be. I'll I, I try and contain my emotions and go, right, well, if you don't want to go to work, you don't get paid. And if, you don't, if you don't get paid, you can't have the things that you want in life. So I go, right, well, what one do you want more? Do you want the things in your life or do you, you know, you want to quit? So, you know, I go with it, go with the other. And that's a thing that I've learned through, through athletics as well is like, not every day is going to go your way. Mm-hmm. You, you, might have, you might have a bad week. You might have a bad month. You might even have a bad year. You know, in athletics, I've, I've had a couple of bad years in terms of not running personal best or running to my best potential. Um, even though I'm still training just as hard and just as much every single day, like in business and in work, it can sometimes feel like a chore, maybe for a day, a week, a month, or a year. But then you've got to ask yourself deep down, do you actually love what you're doing? So then if people genuinely don't like their work, then why why are you in that occupation? Is it there, are you there just to pay the bills? If so, and you want to saunter on and soldier on, that's perfect, but you're not a tree. You can move mm-hmm. and you can find something that you love to do. So even in my profession, uh, being a personal trainer, it's my passion that you know sets me in fire every time I you know I go out the door and I, I I help somebody achieve you know their dress size or their, their personal best in their weights or their personal best in running and races. Too much of anything is a bad thing, as well. Too much of tr- training, too much of one thing. Like even footballers get sick of football, basketballers mm-hmm. get sick of basketball. Sometimes we can sicken ourselves with doing too much. So even when you love something, it's still going to get a little bit of a, mm-hmm. of a chore. And that's all right. I think a lot of people need to understand that we are, as a human race just now, we're getting sold happiness all the time. We're getting sold happiness and comfort. By this, this will make you happy. By this, this will make your life comfortable. And the more we chase happiness and comfort, actually the more pain, sadness gives us. Because we are expecting life to be, well, if I've got this in our life now, well, it should be, we should be happier. Yeah. So and so said that we should be more comfortable now. Mm-hmm. So and so said that if, if you're not happy in life, then you're failing. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, we we're going to go through peaks and troughs of happiness and sadness, and that's that's just that's normal life. But I think that in today's society, we're getting sold through whether it be Apple, whether it be Samsung, whether it be IKEA, whether it be Mercedes, whether it be BMW. Have this in your life, and your life will be complete. Yeah. You will be happy and it'll make your life more comfortable. But ultimately, you have a really nice phone in your hand, but your life's still your life. Nothing's changed. Exactly. I think for me, again, going back to, to, to being a youth worker, I think that one of the things that really strikes me is that, yes, we can sell this image of happiness and comfort, one of the things I think that is sadly lacking, particularly in young people nowadays, is resilience. They mm-hmm. don't know how to deal with things when things aren't going as well, but as they've been sold in the adverts. And, mm-hmm. and, and that in itself then brings in issues about mental health and that feeling of failure and, and not achieving and giving up. And, and, and it's how... How do we turn that around? You know, I, I mean, clearly, if, if you and I could answer that question, we would bottle it and sell it and we would never have to work again. Um, but, you know, in your opinion, how do we turn that around? How do we make people more resilient in life? Whether it's going for a run, eating properly, liking their job, whatever. What's your opinion? Uh, there's, a, there's a couple. And the first, the first one, that, first and foremost, one that comes to my mind is... I think that normal human beings who have celebrities and people they idolise, it may be Cristiano Ronaldo, it may be The Rock, it may be Michael Jordan, it may be these massive, massive figures, Mo Farah, Elliot Kipchoge, who they idolise. 
and social media is, is a gift and a curse where we can we now can see what our celebrities do on a day to day basis. You know, they're now no longer like these people that we faint in front of because we see them every day. So it's a normal reoccurrence for our brain now. Sure. But we we sometimes only ever see the good and the great. We sometimes never see the ugly. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But more often than not, we we are sold on how great their life is. And what that does is make us believe that we as normal human beings who aren't celebrities, who aren't millionaires or aren't on TV all the time and don't have a million or, you know, a billion followers, is that those people have it better than us always. Like, they, like nothing bad happens to them. And when you think about, you know, The Rock in 2019, sorry, 2020, his, his dad passed away. So he had to deal with bereavement. Watching the Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance, his father get murdered. That's great. If these celebrities are human beings. These people go through pain, they go through adversity, just like us. But our brain doesn't make the connection that we are the same because we put them on a pedestal. Yeah. But these people have, like I said before, two arms, two legs, a beating heart and a set of lungs and a brain. No different to you and I. But yet we we put them in a different container yeah. to you to, to, to the, the normal general public. So we we may go, ah, oh, he can get this or she can get that because she's such and such or he's such and such. And we need to that's us playing that victim mentality. Oh, so we think we can't get there because we don't have this or we they, or they got there through luck or they and they may they may well have got there through some sort of luck, timing, whatever it may be. But what they did, what they must have, they had to do was work bloody hard to put themselves in the situation to be lucky. And that's the thing that we keep missing is that hard work gets you wherever you want to be. And sometimes with great timing and the opportunity creates something that we call luck. And I've got a famous quote I say to all my, my athletes and all everybody that maybe asks me about, you know, America or, you know, the marathon project or, the, the Scottish medals, I say, the hard, you know what, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Aye. Mm -hmm. And I think that, so that's, that's one, that's one thing. I think another thing is perspective. I think a lot of people are really lacking perspective in this day and age where, again, they think the grass is greener for somebody else mm -hmm. than them. You know, they're the ones that are going through the hard time. The others are not. And if we can look at, you know, I, I, during lockdown just now where people are going oh, lot it's, it's because of lockdown that I'm starting to uh, get gain weight, it's because of lockdown that I'm starting to get unfit, it's because of lockdown that I'm starting to get depressed or anxious ultimately I could say it's actually because of you the person that's that's why it's hard it's because of you, not lockdown because everybody's going through lockdown Yeah. Mm -hmm. how we view the situation as a human being and then you know, we're, we're, we're thinking everybody's got a better life than us while we're sitting with, a, you know, Netflix on a PS4, while we're sitting on our Apple Mac, searching through YouTube or Google or Instagram, where iPhone charging at the side of us with a roof over our head, and we think we've got a pretty bad life. And I go, <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't know what hard, you, at that point, you don't really know what hard life is. Yeah. Um, so that's perspective Being and then you need to be grateful for what you've got you really like if you're sitting with that situation and you're not being grateful for what you have and the family and friends that you have around you and the situation you're in maybe you, you might be in a job that you don't like but you're still getting a paycheck from month to month yeah. the people that are homeless you know in America the amount of homeless people I saw in, a, in Colorado in the winters of negative 20 degrees Celsius freezing to death mm -hmm. And hear people, you know, with a roof over their head, or they may be, they may not be in the nicest area that they want to be in, but they're making the best of the situation that you have at that moment in time. And then that leads on to stop being entitled, stop feeling as if you're entitled to things that you've not worked hard for yet. Yeah. You know, there's some people that think that because they step on the treadmill and go for an incline walk for 30 minutes or 45 minutes that they should be at the dress size that they've always wanted or the weight they've always wanted. That, that doesn't happen. Or, you know, they, they lift weights for the first time and they wake up the next day and they're like, oh my God, I'm so sore. And I'm thinking, 
what did you expect? You know, what did, what did Arnold, I'm sure Arnold Schwarzenegger probably felt a bit sore after himself lifting, lifting weights. But I think Elliot Choge must have been a bit sore after his, you know, 25 or 26 or 27 mile long run to prepare him for his sub two hour marathon. I'm sure he felt sore a few times. For you to go and do something and not expect any repercussions, good or bad, from your action is entitlement. Yeah. Thinking that you're an exception to the rule. So people need to also understand that with your actions come good or bad consequences. Yeah. So we need to, I guess, take a step back and look at ourselves from an objective view instead of a subjective view and understand that, you know, where we are as a, as a human being, are we, are we where we want to be? If the answer is yes, great. If the answer is no, then let's write down, right, where do you want to be? And then we start working back from there. How are we going to get to where you want to be? Does that mean we need to, you know, we need to go and do a course, a, a CPD course? We need to go and do continual development. Do you need to go back to college? Do you need to go back to university? Let's put these things in place now. During lockdown, let's start making a plan when you've got time. We've got loads of time now. Let's make a plan and let's stick to it. Let's make a plan. Let's get some structure. When that alarm goes off, don't snooze it. Do not snooze that alarm. Get up. Get up. Have your coffee. Have your tea. Have your breakfast, whatever you like to do, and get cracking on with the things that are going to get you closer towards the life that you want to live. Mm -hmm. And if you're not doing that, then you cannot be pissed off with anybody bar yourself. It, it takes a, a, a lot of people a long, long time to realise that you know it's it's about them. It's not about other people, uh, and you know, and they will be pissed off at, at other people if they don't get what they want. You know, whether it's Whatever it is, you know, if you 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 give one of your clients a, a, a training plan and you and you work with them and they lift weights for the first time and they wake up the next morning feeling sore rather than bulging biceps, that's your fault. Rather than well, you know, no, I need to work hard here, you know, and this is going to take a long time to get to where I am. And see, after I get there, I'm still going to have to do it to maintain it and 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 you know we're talking from a fitness point of view but that's anything in life isn't it you know it's it's you work hard to get there and you probably work even harder to stay there yeah and and and, and you know that's that's been my experience I'm obviously a lot older than you but um that's been my experience you know there is no such thing as an overnight success it might appear because of social media, eh, that you know, this person's just appeared from nowhere and, and become this great footballer, or fantastic actor, or fantastic athlete. Whereas the reality is, you and I know that these people have been working their ass in the background for many, many years to become this overnight success. And and you know, and that could be the same whether you're a plumber or a hairdresser or whatever. You need to work your arse off. You need to go to college. You need to do the qualifications to get you know to to, to get there. And you know then. When you're in that position, you can then make decisions about whether you're in your own business, whether you work for somebody else. You know, but there's a there's a journey, and we're all on a journey. And so many people don't recognise that they have to start and continue with that journey. And I suppose one of the things that, that, that we've been talking about is, you know, is 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 how do we motivate people? You know, and and that's you know. You know, that, that's, that's a fairly catch-all phrase, that, but how do we motivate people? How do we mo motivate people during this unprecedented period that we're in? Mm -hmm. I personally have seen this as an opportunity, you know, so, so my days are actually quite structured in lockdown, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do my work, I'll take the dog for a walk, I'll go for a run, I'll spend some time online searching my family history, you know, and, 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 and it's become fairly structured, probably more structured than it was before lockdown. Uh, and, and, you know, and I've seen this as an opportunity to, to do things that I've maybe been putting off or not had the time to do previously. Uh, but how, how do we motivate people to see times like this as an opportunity to get fit, to achieve things, to, to improve themselves? Yeah, I, I, I like... One of the things I like to do in the morning, if I'm not feeling, you know, too too motivated to, to go out and train that day, is I like to watch something on YouTube about my role models, whether that be somebody like Anthony Joshua. Uh, I might watch a, a little documentary on his training, maybe that he got beat off Andy Ruiz, mm -hmm. but then he came back and got his titles back again, and understanding that even the best of us can have an off day. Uh, watching 
Elliot Kipchoge training in, in Kenya, but then also his his work ethic, his drive to be successful is unrelenting. So then if I want to be as good as I can be, then I need to adopt those traits as well. So my idols will fill me full of motivation to then go and act. But ultimately, it's a, what we want to do is try and make sure that people are doing the action because the action is what's going to get you everywhere. So if I, I watch a wee, a wee 15, 20 minutes of my, 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 my idols in the morning, and coffee is always a good one. Coffee getting the caffeine in me. I love my coffee in the morning. And also seeing, seeing where, where I've come from as well, thinking about, you know, just thinking where, where, where have I came from? I've came from, you know, Drum Chapel. I've moved to Mary Hill. I then purposely went on my quest to move down to London and train with the Great Britain squad. Then I, move, I, I then get a scholarship to America. Then I come back full circle back to Glasgow to um, and have my own, my own flat, my own car, my own business. Like sometimes you've got to some take a wee step back, get out of your own head and think about the things that you've achieved in life. The thing, like if you're still here, if your heart is beating, you have a chance. Mm-hmm to change your life and I think we don't give ourselves credit for how tough we actually are you know there might be there might be people who are listening to this that have went through some more traumatic events than I've went through but they're still here so it shows that they're pretty bloody tough yeah so being tougher than the occasion that is upon you at that moment in time not seizing the moment of that occasion where you know right I'm going to get up I'm going to go for a 10-minute or a 20-minute walk, or I'm going to go for a 10-minute, 20-minute run. And I think that leads into the next thing is having structure. So say, you know, I'm going to do Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm going to have a day off in between, and I'm going to have a good weekend. I'm going to enjoy my weekend for being so well-disciplined and structured through Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I think that's perfect. You should reward yourself for doing the things that you had to have discipline to do, making a commitment to doing those things but not setting the bar too high. So what I mean by that is if it's a first, if you're listening to this podcast and you're super motivated to start on Monday to go out and do a, a, a run or a, a big walk or whatever it may be, or a, a circuit class or a yoga class, start small. Yeah. So if you, if you want to go out for 30 minutes, you say, I'm going to go out and run for 30 minutes. And I'll say, when was the last time you went out running? Oh, five years ago. Don't, don't start with 30 minutes. What I'd say is go out for maybe five minutes, go and walk for five minutes, and then run back from the five-minute point that you walked. Because ultimately, that may only take three three minutes. So then you're out for eight minutes, maybe eight to ten minutes. Do that. Do something that is achievable. Give yourself a pat on the back for doing it and feel really good that you achieved something for that day. Make it achievable. I think too many people overthink exercise and success where they think that if you don't train for an hour then it doesn't mean anything and then because I've bigged up that hour so much they then just let it go they let the day pass them by with indecisiveness so I really believe under shoot your goal to start achieve it achieve it and more so if you say, right, I'm going to go out for 10 minutes, and you get to 10 minutes, you go, I said, I'm going to do another five. There you go. You've done five more minutes, and you, <laughs> then you've achieved. So I fully believe that you should start with a plan, stick to it, make it very, very achievable, if not underachievable. Because I think we, in fitness, if we want to achieve something, we, will, we want to be, like we said, the finished product right away. Mm-hmm. And we're not. We need to build up to that. So making a little plan where you can build up, doing the Achieve More Scotland, doing the workout classes that we're putting on every week. Mm-hmm. And, and enjoy, enjoy. Don't look at these things as chores or things that are, you know, that are going to make you frustrated. Enjoy these times where you can go outdoors once or twice a day, depending on the government guidelines. Yeah. And embracing outdoors, like the opportunity now to go outdoors and you're not stuck in a, an office or you're not stuck in a, a gym or you're not 
in any of these industries just now, you're at home, the time that you would be spending traveling to and from work, you could use that time now to exercise, get that time back and make it exercise time. Absolutely. You, from there, embrace this time, embrace it because we're not going to have this again. Hopefully, we don't want this to happen again. We want, we want the world to go back to what we call normal. Mm -hmm. So during this uncertain time where we can have that freedom to go out a little bit more than normal, use it for exercise. When you exercise, you start to feel good about yourself. You start to feel a little bit more self-fulfilled. You get a bit of self-confidence and self-achievement as well. And that's what helps with mental health also. Getting outside, getting the fresh air, not cooped up watching social media, YouTube, Netflix, Amazon Prime. These things are fit. These, the reason why we've got a lot of mental health issues, not the beyond end, end all, but I think technology has a little bit to play in this process where if human beings 20 years ago, just only 20 years ago, we never had this. Exactly. Yeah. And now we've been on the planet, human beings, for 2,000 years. But within 20 years, we have made so much technological shift that our brain doesn't know how to cope with this quite yet, also. Aye. So we are still in a way where our brain actually does like to be outside and doing, you know, the nature things of life mm -hmm. going out, going for a walk, go out, go for a run, or go out with your, the, the person that you're living with in your house going out a walk with them, or if you want to go out on your own, listen to an audio book, listen to a podcast, listen to some music, use technology in a good way to get yourself outdoors and get some of that fresh air in you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think these are very, very good bits of advice, you know, and, and there's nothing that you've said that is beyond anyone. You know, you know, walk for five minutes, run for three minutes, walk for ten minutes, Run for three minutes, you know, whatever it is. But you, you know, you, you, you're advising people to be realistic uh, and to set themselves goals that are achievable and, and, and increase them. But you know, it also, you're advising people to accept the simple things in life. Again, you know, taking this current situation, I've actually enjoyed the opportunity to spend time with family before because everybody's running about doing jobs or, you know, having busy lives, you never go it. So, you know, we've spent a bit of time together and it's been really enjoyable. And, you know, I think the other side of that is there are people that you don't see, like, like you know, my mum, you know, my in-laws, you know, who are, who are in their 70s and you want to spend a bit of time with them, you want to see that they're okay. Um, but again, that's one of the positive things about technology is we can do this sort of thing. You know, and that, that, that is a positive. We stay connected in a way that we couldn't before, but you know, that you, you need that balance. You really do. Um, you touched on uh, there, you know, what, what we, we being Fontana Fit and Achieve More, uh, have, have uh, started to do. And I think, I wonder if, if it's worth saying a wee bit more about uh, the, the partnership and, uh, and developing. You know, obviously, we've, uh, we've known each other uh, for, for, for a while now through your wife, Caroline, who works for Nike, and Nike have been a partner for Achieve More. And through that, uh, you got to find out a wee bit about the charity. Tell us a wee bit about what you like about the charity and, and what makes you want to be involved with the charity, if you can tell us that. Yeah, I, I, I just believe that Achieve More Scotland is, is me in general, in terms of everything that I went through as a kid to where I am now is what Achieve More wants to achieve with kids mm -hmm. that are from you know, areas that don't have a head start, that they think they don't have a head start in life. They may be from you know, underprivileged uh, backgrounds, families. Some may not, may not have a family. And Achieve More Scotland is a family that's opening their arms up to every kid and any, any way, anywhere in Scotland. And to have, to have that charity there to help kids make better choices and educate them not in a not in an academic way but in a life way yeah. is unbelievable that I wish that I had that when I was a kid and maybe I'd have been I could have when I could have stopped some of the adversity of you know if I could have spoke to somebody 
that was, you know, not my family, not my not my parents, not my friends, but somebody from Achieve More Scotland. That sometimes when you speak to, a, you can be a bit more open with a stranger than you can with your own your own family. Just somebody there to go, you know. By the way, I, I'm I'm making myself sick, and, and they they then give you advice, like real life advice, instead of nobody's you know, judging you. Yeah, like you know, if you went and said that to a, a school teacher, they'd either they'd lock you up or your family up for allowing that to happen. Whereas sometimes kids just do things because they just think it's right, and you know, it just absolutely. And so I, I really believe that Achieve More Scotland is the success story that kids need. Like I've like I've had coming from Drum Chapel and having my own business and being successful as an athlete, using sport as a way to educate and help people learn yeah. it in the real world. I, I, fully, I fully believe that it's, it's a noble thing that you're, you're doing. And it, from, from, from my, my standpoint, like I, I was wanting for the London Marathon to run the London Marathon for a charity. And it was between, because my, my dad's went through cancer, or because I've, I've been, you know, where a lot of underprivileged kids have came from, like Drum Chapel and Mary Hill, where there isn't a lot of money at schools and there's not a lot of money in families to, you know, maybe give them uh, a football top or a football strip for their primary school. I was wanting to do something for underprivileged kids in yeah. sport to, with a charity. And that's where Achieve More actually popped in. I was like, do you know what I want to do? I want to do the, the London Marathon and raise money for a, a, a group of kids that are disadvantaged like I was. And then it was it, it came to me, Achieve More Scotland. It's really appreciated. And that opportunity will come, whether it's later this year or next year. And uh, it is really appreciated. But it works both ways because, you know, from our point of view, and it's exactly what you said there, we can, we can say, well, look at Sean, you know, Sean's running the London Marathon, he's running the Valencia Marathon, you know, he's training with the, the, the Scottish Commonwealth Games Marathon Training Squad. But there's a story behind that, which is your story. You know, a young person from a deprived area who, you know, potentially had limited day life opportunities, but, you know, through a, a desire to, to, to be better, be a different person, has been in a journey and here's the things that have been achieved and he's still working hard. So that's, you make it easy for us to, to, to sell that to young people. Here's a perfect example. Here's that role model that we keep talking about. So uh, you know, it, 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 works, it works for both of us in that respect. And the other thing that we're doing just now, again, you touched on is for those uh, particularly primary pupils who generally are stuck at home, uh, you are, are producing me 10, 15 minute fitness videos targeted at that age group, which we are then sending to schools who we have relationships with to put in their social media. We also post it onto their social media so that it reaches a wider audience and can be available to any anybody who wants to do some, some real, real simple, basic exercises that, that are achievable, eh, but will help to, to, to improve, again, physically and, and, and mentally at, at, at this time. Plans for the future. Um, obviously, this period of time leaves us in a bit of limbo, but, you know, we, we see you very much as being this guy who will be a role model, who will, you know, be that positive motivator for uh, participants, eh, not just for participants, but for their families and the likes. And we are, you know, we are developing a really, really good relationship here. And it's something I'm, I'm, I'm just so pleased has happened. And it's another opportunity that's come about during lockdown. You know, it's, it's you know, so, eh, and, and, and we're making the most of the opportunity at this point in time and you know the plans are there for next year and, and beyond as well it's, it's really really exciting in terms of your plans your personal plans to talk to us again about Fontana Fit and about Fontana the athlete what are your plans over the next couple of years what's your ambitions the the athlete wants to represent Scotland at the 2022 Commonwealth Games in Birmingham so it'd be a UK Games, almost, we could almost say a home Games for British athletes. There'd be nothing better than me sticking on that Scotland vest over the marathon or over the 10,000 metres for, for Scotland in, 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 our, in, you know, in, in Britain. Another, another massive goal for me is I want to represent Great Britain as well. 
whether that be over the 10,000 metres or over the, the half marathon or the marathon, depending if the European Championships, whether it be a half marathon or a marathon event. And from there, just, you know, each day just become a, a better version of myself as an athlete and as a person. And in the business sense, right now, you're absolutely right in terms of the opportunity that lockdown has given a lot of individuals. And for me is how influential being online is. So it's really opened my eyes up to being on an online trainer, an online coach, having doing online classes from the comfort of my own home, helping people get fit without any equipment whatsoever. That that is very powerful, and I think I'm going to take that into even when lockdown is over. I'm going to do a lot more online work. I also, in a couple of years' time, would love to have my own location, my own Fontana Fit gym, and again, we could host kids boot camps in the in the gym um all these sort of like the, the big plan is to have fontana fit on a building one day and have my own, my own gym my own facility but you know as, as as the times are uncertain just now taking advantage of this opportunity where i felt that at one point you had to trade money for time basically I had to go to work to get paid but now i'm able to do it from an online standpoint which is it's completely baffled me but because I, even though I, I, I'm I'm kind of young but at the same time I'm a bit of an old soul at heart where I wasn't I, I was I was around when there was no internet I was around when there was no mobile phones I still have that old school mentality where I'd go to the gym I would train my clients make money and then come home I never thought of this whole other world of what about if you didn't go to a location and you actually worked from home or you worked from anywhere in the world and still earn money? I thought that was a pipe dream, but it's actually the plans are, you know, in place. And it's like you said, it's, a, it's an opportunity that I've never had before. Yeah. So I think it will go more online and also the partnership with Achieve More Scotland, where doing the weekly videos to help keep kids active, to help keep families active, not only to help their, their physical, but also their mental well-being. These, these things have completely changed my idea on, you know, how to train people as well. So, like, I am, and this is what I say to everybody, you're never a finished product. Never think that you're, you've, you've learned everything. Even during lockdown, I, I am learning a lot more about business than I, I have in a long, long time. So it's, it's been such a, an eye-opener. To, to be working online with yourself and with Fintana Fit and then also having that time to, to spend with family and you know train and enjoy my, my athletics as well. Uh, it's fantastic, it really is. One of the things that I can guarantee to you is uh, if you're pulling on that Scotland vest in Birmingham in 2022, there'll be a team to achieve more young people there cheering. Mr. Fantana on, uh, I guarantee it, but that's not to put you under any pressure, it's something I think we would all love to see, uh, most definitely, um, and again, and it reinforces and strengthens that whole thing about, here's this guy, uh, look at the 14-year-old Sean, and look at this guy representing his country, you know, and you know, that's, that's, that's a, an incredibly powerful story for us in terms of teaching young people resilience and the power of positive thinking and, and, and working hard to, to get where they are. So, uh, it, you know, we're behind you in that respect. Um, and it will mean a lot to, to the, the organisation to see someone who has invested uh, their, their time and effort into supporting the charity to achieving another one of their goals. It's really, really mm -hmm. appreciated. And I'm really excited about potentially what the future will hold for this partnership. Um, I know the schools, uh, even though we're in week, only in week two of the fitness videos, the schools are absolutely loving them uh, already. Uh, I think it's making their job easier. You know, they're, um, they're, they're able to say, here's a 15 minute video gone, that's part of your PE for the day, eh, and they look forward to it, and different schools have used them in different ways, so it's getting that message out there, about being physically active, eh, even when you're restricted, and you don't need hours and hours to do it, so eh, aye, it's exciting times ahead for us, I really think. Before we finish up, is there anything else you feel eh, you want to say? Is there any message that you want to get across to, to, to achieve more participants or their families or anything? 
yeah, the we've we've spoke about coming from you know places of that are rough, that are we feel that are underprivileged backgrounds, but those tough times made me the person I am today. Mm-hmm. So yeah. when kids think that, you know, coming from Drum Chapel or Poso or Castle Milk or whatever they feel that is a rough area that is, you know, council estate and you're you're dodging maybe, you know, glass bottles or stones or there's there's drugs around you or you've got one, you've got a choice to not conform to that. That's the first one. The second one is when you think that other people in other areas are better off, they're not because they they don't know what hard is. They don't know what struggle is from an early age, whereas these kids and we do. So I feel that that actually puts us at an advantage. Yeah. In I, life. I, I, I would agree with you. I would, I would certainly agree. There's more to be learned for, 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 for uh, challenging circumstances. Um, and again, that's one of the sort of key messages that we consistently have tried to give to young people. You know, learn from your experiences and take it with you at the next stage of your life. Um, and that's a, a message that's going to come k- consistently from Fontana Fit and achieve more uh, as, as, as we go forward. Um, Sean, uh, as always, it's a pleasure to speak to you. Uh, and I think it's, it's a real opportunity to let other people hear uh, the, about your background, about your own challenges, about your own motivations, about where you are now. And there is another opportunity to, 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 to hear uh, Sean Fontana on an ongoing basis because you indeed have your own podcast. You want to say a wee bit about that? Just you want to give it a quick plug before we finish up? Yeah, so if, if, the, you know, if the listeners out there want to you know, have, have a bit more content to listen to as well as achieve more um, and they're out there wanting to go for a wee walk or during breakfast, put something on. I've got my own podcast called Sean Fontana Podcast. And there I, I I talk on it myself, you know, talking about daily issues or things about motivation, training, the experiences I've had during my athletics career, but also interview top international athletes, mostly from Scotland, and ask them about their experiences and how they get into sport, how they get into athletics and how they they feel they've achieved top level success in Scotland and the world as well. I and I'm a listener eh, 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 and I love it. Eh, and there are plenty of opportunities. Eh, you can get that on iTunes, on Spotify, and Acast. Is that right? Uh, Castbox. Gosh, that's the one. That's the one. So again, just search for Sean Fantana podcast, and it's a great listen. It varies in length of time. Uh, so there's shorter ones or longer ones. Covers lots of big uh, subjects, and it's fair to say you're very passionate uh, <laughs> in the podcast at times, and you don't hold back. Which uh, that honesty is something that, that I love and appreciate, uh, and, and and I'm sure other people will too. Sean. Really appreciated your time. Thanks so much. I hope we haven't kept you back for, for a run. <laughs> it's been amazing to be on. It's, uh, thank you for achieving more and yourself for having me on the podcast. And it's something, again, I think as we go forward, I would like to do, you know, we may at times pick a, a, a subject of the day that doesn't involve running or whatever and, and they maybe have a wee rant uh, about, about certain things that are happening or offer advice and guidance to, to our participants. But I don't think this will be a one-off and I look forward to, to the opportunity to chat to you uh, very, very soon. So thank you, Sean. Uh, keep up the great work in terms of Fontana Fit and with your training and best of luck in achieving your goals in the future thank you very much Robert it was a pleasure all the very best mate bye bye